So welcome to the latest episode of EY's videos on lease accounting. So in this short video, we will provide a summary of the effects of the first year of implementation of IFRS 16 leases by large IFRS reporters based on our recent survey. We'll also look at the results of our survey on how these entities change their disclosures for alternative performance measures or APMs, which are often found in annual reports outside the financial statements when they first adopted the standard. Our focus in this part of the survey was to determine how entities address the impact of adopting IFRS 16 in their financial communications to investors. While we know that financial statements, that the financial statements contain the disclosures mandated by the standard, we wanted to explore how entities adapted information outside the financial statements as a result of changes to lease accounting. So I am Jeremy Barnes. I'm a senior manager with the global IFRS services team at EY Global in London. And I'm joined today by Victor Chan. He is an international director at EY Global in London. And Victor is a member of EY's global IFRS services team and amongst others, the Global Leases subject matter group. So Victor, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. Now, I, I know the research team spent quite some time on this project. Can you give us an overview of it? Sure. We started with the population of the 2020 list of Fortune Global 500 companies and selected up to the five highest ranked IFRS filers with publicly available financial statements and annual reports in each of the 12 different industry sectors. In total, we looked at the financial statements and end reports of 58 entities when they first adopted IFRS 16. Nearly all of them applied a modified retrospective approach on transition. IFRS filers are those entities which prepare financial statements based on IFRS as issued by the International Accounting Standards Board, IFRS as endorsed by the European Union, or the national accounting standards that are substantially the same as IFRS and which have adopted the new lease standard. This is a study on IFRS financial statements. Thus, entities preparing financial statements under US GAAP or other local GAAP financial statements that are not prepared on substantially the same basis as IFRS were excluded. Consequently, most of the entities surveyed were headquartered either in Europe or in countries in Asia Pacific where the accounting standards have converged with IFRS. In performing this survey, we read the financial statements, especially the quantitative impact of the date of initial application, as well as the relevant sections on management commentary to understand how entities explained the impact of IFRS 16 on their financial position, results, and cash flows, and to identify any changes to the use of APMs. So before we look at the results of this survey, our previous video presented the results of a survey we performed on the expected impact of transition to IFRS 16, mainly using the disclosures made under IS 8, accounting policies, changes in accounting estimates and errors. And just to remind viewers, Victor, can you provide a summary of those results? Sure. Based on the disclosures entities made under IS 8, in their financial statements immediately preceding the adoption of IFRS 16, we identified sectors that were expecting to be more significantly impacted than others based on the balance sheet grossing up of assets and liabilities. We had identified that sectors that previously had a significant volume of operating leases, such as airlines, retail and apparel, shipping and transport, and telecommunications would likely to be more impacted this finding generally reflects the long-standing business practice of leasing high-value assets such as vessels and retail space. Conversely, entities where the volume of assets under operating leases were not so significant, particularly financial institutions, were less impacted by the adoption of IFRS 16. So now we have shown the actual results of adopting IFRS 16 compared with the expected increase in total assets across sectors. They look very consistent with the expectations from our previous survey, don't they? That's right. Um, airlines, retail and apparel, shipping and transport, and telecommunications continue to be the sectors with the most impact from the adoption of IFRS 16. For example, on average, entities in the airlines and retail and apparel sectors 
by recognizing right of use assets arising from leases previously classified and operating leases upon transition from IFRS 16 increase their total assets by 14%. Power and utilities, real estate, and financial services sectors were least impacted. For these sectors, the corresponding increase in total assets was 2% or less on average. Another observation is that within the four sectors most impacted by the standard, the range of the impact measured by the increase in total assets was quite wide. This is also consistent with our previous survey results. So for this slide, we have tabulated for each sector the average increase in recognized right-of-use assets and lease liabilities arising from leases previously classified as operating leases upon transition to IFRS 16 as a percentage of the entity's consolidated total assets and liabilities, respectively. We have already talked about the trend for right-of-use assets in the previous slide. And while the debt-to-equity ratio of an entity depends on its capital policy, when one analyzes the impact of lease accounting by sector, it is quite clear that the trend for liabilities was quite consistent with the trend for assets. Yes, and in addition, we also looked at the change in equity on the date of initial application, and the decrease in equity as a percentage of total equity was relatively small, even for some of the sectors that were experiencing a significant impact on assets and liabilities. We think there are two reasons for that. Firstly, most entities use the modified retrospective approach for transition, and the right-of-use assets are often initially measured at an amount that is similar to the lease liability after adjusting for any prepaid or accrued lease payments immediately before the date of initial application, and hence there was no impact on equity. Alternatively, the right-of-use assets could have been measured using the carrying amount as if IRS 16 had been applied since the commencement date, but were discounted using the lessee's incremental borrowing rate at the date of initial application. Because of the low interest rate environment in many jurisdictions, the interest effect didn't result in a significant front-loaded expense attribution pattern, and the impact on equity on the date of initial application was generally low. I think the actual results confirm that the key effect of IVR 16 is reflected on the balance sheet, as opposed to the timing of expense recognition for leases. As this survey has also focused on the disclosures made by entities in the management commentary section of the annual report, what did we find around how the effects of IFRS 16 had been explained? I think the overarching theme is that the more significant the effects of IFRS 16 were on an entity's financial statements, the more disclosures and explanations were added to the management commentary. As we discussed in the previous slide, the most significant effects of IFRS 16 could be observed in the airlines, retail and apparel, shipping and transport, and telecommunications sector. Most of the entities that we surveyed in these sectors used the modified retrospective approach uh, when transitioning to IFRS 16. That means that they didn't restate the comparative information in their financial statements. However, uh, in their management commentary, many of these entities explained the changes brought by IFRS 16 by including additional columns of financial information, either to present comparatives restated to include the impact arising from the adoption of IFRS 16, or presenting current year information both with and excluding the effects of adopting the standard. For entities that were less impacted by IFRS 16, such as financial institutions, there was minimal disclosure, or in some cases, no disclosure of the effects of IFRS 16 in management commentary. Readers of these annual reports might only find the relevant information in the footnotes of the financial statements. And what were the key findings concerning the use of APMs and changes entities made to APMs as a result of, adop of adopting IFRS 16? A number of entities have changed or substituted the APMs presented in the annual reports. Unsurprisingly, we noted this in the four sectors most significantly impacted by IFRS 16. For example, certain entities uh, prior to the adoption of IFRS 16 
Use an APM called EBITDA or earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization, and rent. With the adoption of IVR 16, the rental expense for assets that had been leased under operating leases has now been substituted for depreciation of the right of use asset and interest expense on the lease liability. Therefore, entities that had been using EBITDA may have now changed the definition of the measure to EBITDA uh, earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. However, we also found some entities that had used EBITDA as a measure of operational performance prior to adopting IVR 16 have now adjusted the measure to include depreciation of right of use assets and interest expenses on recognized lease liabilities to keep the basis of measurements consistent across the years. Depending on geography and sectors, IFRS 16 has led to changes in EBITDA in both directions. Some entities have started to include lease payments or lease costs and change the APMs, while others have continued to exclude and adjust the APMs accordingly. Free cash flow is another measure impacted by IFRS 16. Some entities define this as the net cash flow from operating and investing activities. The adoption of IFRS 16 has led to entities reclassifying cash outflows on lease payments from operating to financing activities as required by the standard in the statement of cash flows. We found that several entities changed the definition or calculation of free cash flow to become, for example, free cash flow after leases as they adjusted free cash flow for repayments of lease liabilities. And for the balance sheet, the debt level has also been impacted by IFRS 16 as additional liabilities are recognized for leases that were previously classified as operating leases and thus off balance sheet under the previous standard. Some entities previously added a multiple of operating lease expense to its net debt to present an APM, often called the adjusted net debt, to better reflect the level of indebtedness. This may be deemed no longer necessary since the adoption of IVR 16, um, and they now just present net debt from the balance sheet, which includes lease liabilities. I think it is important to emphasize that uh, the term net debt is used differently from entity to entity, where some include and others exclude lease liabilities and other items. So there may not be comparability uh, among those that use the term net debt. Thank you, Victor. That's been very helpful. Um, we've now come to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I'm Jeremy Barnes, and we'll bring you more insights on IFRS 16 in future episodes.